Hello, my name is David Robertshaw. I'm a registered nurse and a lecturer at the University of Derby. And um, this discussion is part of the Critical Care Quick Start series, um, where we're talking about some of the um, sort of key skills and specific areas that people need, um, whether they are new to critical care or they are returning to critical care, um, just to help them uh, get some of those skills and to prepare them for what lies ahead really um, over the next few months. So in this discussion I'm going to be talking about ventilation which is one of the um, key aspects of, of intensive care. Each of these um, short presentations are about 20 minutes or so um, so you should be able to use them as, as a sort of rapid introduction to the to the area but you might want to think about doing some more reading around as well as this but Hopefully this will be a useful quick start for you. So during the next 20-25 uh, minutes we're going to talk a bit about what ventilation is, why we need it, uh, a little bit about what its complications are. We're going to talk about some of the modes of ventilation and we'll talk about some of the settings and measurements that we have that we can use and change with ventilation. We'll also talk a bit about some of the implications of care and safety of ventilated patients because Obviously, um, this is not something that a lot of people do every day, and these people are very sick, they're very poor, so we do need to think a bit, about, a bit differently sometimes about the care that we provide. So ventilation is, uh, you know, the actual concept of ventilation is a, is a, a normal everyday process. We're talking about breathing. Um, most people do this fairly normally, healthily and well. And we do this, don't we, by increasing the size of our chest and then that sucks air into our lungs. Um, and then we relax and the, the muscles relax and we turn back the, the elastic recoil of our lungs and all the muscles around our lungs pushes the air back out and we breathe as normal. But sometimes um, we can't breathe as normal or sometimes we need some extra help to be able to breathe. Um, and really this kind of falls into sort of one or two categories. So the first category really is what we call type one respiratory failure. And that's when we've not got enough oxygen in our system. And it's that alone, really. The second type, um, type two respiratory failure, is when we've got a low level of oxygen, but we've also got a high level of carbon dioxide. And that is danger territory, really. Um, some of the common reasons that we've got for ventilation are, for example, if people are uh, breathing very quickly because of whatever reason they're becoming tired, um, you know, their, their work of breathing is very high and um, perhaps somebody's got a very low arterial oxygen level and we need to, to provide them a higher level of oxygen supply than they can provide by themselves. Um, they may be getting exhausted, confused. Um, we may also want to do it because we want to take over somebody's bodily system so that we can give them a rest. So um, there's lots of different reasons why I might ventilate somebody, but in the current kind of pandemic situation, we know that lots of our patients have got ARDS and therefore they need ventilation to be able to provide them with enough oxygen in their system to be able to keep them alive. So mechanical ventilation really is about using what we call positive pressure devices and we'll talk about that in a bit to provide oxygen and carbon dioxide transport um, between the environment and our um, capillaries basically. So that, that is essentially all mechanical ventilation is. So there are lots of different types of ventilator modes um, and we're going to talk about some of the, the main ones but actually there are many many others and a lot of these are proprietary named um, modes they vary with the ventilator system and the setup um, and actually the choice the, the mode at which you use depends very much on um, the patient uh, and upon what their requirements are their disease their condition um, but also a bit about um, what the evidence says is appropriate for that kind of patient um, we have got a bit less nowadays of um, sort of like user preference or you know doctor preference and actually we're being much more led by evidence which is which is a good thing that's what we should be doing. So, so some of the most common methods that we've got the modes of ventilation BiPAP you may have heard of and that's uh, where we have a, in effect two levels and a higher level and a lower level uh, and, and the ventilator will cycle between those two modes. Um, CPAP or continuous positive airway pressure provides basically a continuous level behind the background of pressure and um, and the patient can breathe spontaneously on top of that if they don't it, it may not give them breaths um, but if they do uh, we can give it an extra push and extra help and that's that's a really good thing for weaning 
So of the older modes of ventilation, we've got pressure synchronized, uh, intermittent mechanical ventilation and volume synchronized. And um, these are two sort of older modes of ventilation, but you may see that these on some ventilators. And what they do basically is they will deliver a standard amount of breaths or they will synchronize with the patient themselves up to a maximum pressure or up to a maximum volume. But they, as I say, they are older modes. And often we do hear, um, we do see people that have what we call volume trauma or barotrauma or you know, just generally lung trauma because of the ventilator system which they are on. So here's some of the other types. You've got PRVC, which is pressure regulated volume control. This basically gives a, a set volume, but up to a maximum pressure with a, tie, a, a target tidal volume, and that will limit injury. So that's a better mode than, um, for example, uh, volume SIMV, which was on a previous mode. PRVC will give um, a, a, the best volume it can do up to a maximum pressure. You may also see APRV, which is airway pressure release ventilation. Um, this is an open lung uh, method of ventilation where there are two levels. Um, and in effect, the ventilation happens in the expiratory, the release phase of the breath. You may also see people who are on what is often called NIPI or non-invasive positive pressure ventilation, um, which is where we, we don't have a patient who's intubated. We've got somebody who has a, an external tight fitting mask and that will deliver some extra breath and some positive pressure into somebody's um, lungs um, without them having to be asleep or intubated. But, but obviously that's an earlier type therapy and, and often these people do need intubating. It can also be used as a bridge back to um, normal breathing as well. So another mode you may see is something called PSV or ASV, but often these modes are an add-on to other modes and they basically give uh, patients the opportunity to spontaneously breathe, to add their own breaths um, with their ventilator mode. And what these, this will do is, is it will give an extra push into those particular breaths so, the, so that people will, um, can, can and essentially wean from the ventilator. Um, because often that is a problem that somebody may be on a ventilator for a long time, they may end up um, dependent upon that because of lots of different reasons, if you know, things like muscle wastage, wastage for example, um, you know, that is something we have to be very careful of. You may also see or have heard of something called HFOV, which is high frequency oscillatory ventilation. Um, in effect, this is like a, a this is a massive machine that, that um, delivers breaths at many, many times a minute. Um, this actually has a very poor evidence base um, for ARDS, and it used to be used quite frequently, but nowadays it is kind of on the list of um, therapies that we should not be using. We should not be using HFOV. Um, because of what the evidence tells us about it. So to summarize really with this, modes and the settings generally are set by anesthetists or intensive care doctors. Um, occasionally intensive care nurses will make changes to ventilation modes dependent upon what the gases and the, the general uh, patient condition is telling us. But um, what we would say is if, if, if you are ever uncertain about the mode or what, what's happening with your patient, um, always ask. People are very, very happy to come and discuss and talk about and various settings with you. So there's lots of um, numbers on a ventilator and lots of things we have to write down on a big chart or we record electronically. Um, and this is just to go through some, what some of those are really. So FiO2 is the fraction of inspired oxygen. It is often written as a decimal, as a 0.4, for example, rather than 40%. Um, but that allows us to track the amount of oxygen we're giving patients. And obviously, as we know, very high levels of oxygen can cause toxicity um, and even worse of illness. So we, we do need to be reducing that as best we can, as fast we can. So we can also record and we can also set if we need to do, but we, we shouldn't do really, tidal volume. And that's the volume of each breath as it goes in. Um, and it really shouldn't be too high, otherwise we can end up with um, damage and trauma in somebody's lungs. And in fact, we know that lower uh, tidal volumes can actually be lung, can be lung protective in ARDS, so we should be keeping tidal volumes down as much as possible. Minute volume in effect is the tidal volume times the number of uh, breaths in a minute. That will tell us exactly the volume of the air delivered in one minute. Peak pressure, this is the highest record of pressure rec recorded throughout the cycle. Um, and again, we sh this shouldn't be too high, this should be a bit lower. Um, because we, if it's too high, we can end up causing trauma in somebody's lungs. Sometimes we can, ventilators will give us a mean airway pressure as well. So that's a pressure across the whole cycle so that we can keep an eye on 
and what that may be. Um, we can set things like the inspiration time and the I to E ratio, and that's the inspiration to expiratory ratio for the time. And these can be longer or shorter, and really it depends on what we're trying to achieve with our patient. But you know, if we don't just have a standard in and out breath, it can be shorter on the in or longer on the in, um, shorter on the out, longer on the out. So we can we can set those kinds of things to see uh, you know, if we need to make some changes and if they do, those changes do make a difference to our patient's condition. So respiratory rate, we can, our, our ventilators will, will record this um, if somebody's breathing spontaneously or we can set this. And lots of these settings we will change based on their blood gases, the gases which um, are recorded inside somebody's arteries, the oxygen and carbon dioxide and other numbers like pH. Um, and we can adjust all of these to make subtle changes um, to get our patient in the most optimum condition. One of these things is called PEEP. So you might hear that um, as, as a regular term said, that PEEP is positive end expiratory pressure. And this basically is the background pressure, pressure um, at the bottom of the breath. And it's something which keeps the airways open all the time throughout the whole cycle and prevents those alveoli from collapsing. Um, thereby increasing the oxygen exchange. So this is something that we can do. We can increase this as an alternative to increasing oxygen um, amounts. And actually, it can be used to promote an open lung type of ventilation. But we do have to be very careful because high levels of PEEP plus a, a pressure of a breath inwards um, can actually cause worse lung injury and trauma. So we, should, we shouldn't take it too high. Um, and there is now some emerging evidence about levels of PEEP that we should have and that it shouldn't be too high. Um, often people are very aggressive with PEEP, but actually we should not be too aggressive with it. Um, we can keep that within our normal um, boundaries. So just a few things to say about the care, safety and complications really of somebody on a ventilator. You are keeping somebody alive. A ventilator um, replaces the breathing function that somebody would normally have. And actually that can be quite scary. You know their life is in your hands and it's, it's dependent upon the successful use of the equipment so really that leads us to say never be complacent about the equipment they are using always be trained always keep safety in in the forefront of your mind and think about the scenarios that could happen so um intensive care nurses are quite good at planning two or three steps ahead so think you know if the tube came out now what would i need to be able to put it back in or what, what would i need to do and therefore you can plan for all of those scenarios um, that might be, you know, having a tube nearby, um, having having um, ambi bags and things that you might need to be able to, to keep your person going, keep them alive. You might run out of oxygen or power, and you do need to think about what you might do if those things happen. So, as a as a nurse or a doctor, it's really important to keep an eye on your patient's appearance, their condition, and monitor that. Um, you know, remember, look, listen, and feel. Have a listen to their chest uh, on a regular basis. Look at their blood gases. Make sure you review the charts and the documentation uh, on a very regular basis. So my advice would be would be to check everything as as often as you possibly can do. Um, I mean, don't be going crazy and, and checking stuff every twenty minutes. But you know, for example, cuff pressure, which are, which is the pressure at the bottom of the ET tube, we should be measuring that on a fairly regular basis and recording that and making sure that's within acceptable boundaries of what we're looking for. And, um, you know, we should be checking, it goes without saying, we should be checking medicines and infusions on a regular basis, just to see what's running out, what's coming in the next hour or two, and starting to plan ahead um, for when those things run out. But the alarms, ventilator alarms, are absolutely vital. They, they will, um, you can set them as close or as far apart as you want to do, but really they will uh, save you. They'll save your patient's life if a uh, tube comes out or something goes wrong, the ventilator alarms will tell you straight away that something's um, going wrong. And actually, um, we should respond to those. Um, we, should, we should go investigate what those are. So it goes without saying as well that we should assess for all of the normal things that a person would do. We are breathing for them, but actually we need to think about what all the normal things they would do and implement the care accordingly that we would do for that person. Uh, there are some um, care bundles that we can use. So for example, um, head of bed elevation, you know, daily sedation vacations, um, continuous subotic secretion drainage, um, 
spectacle, so prophylaxis, DBT, prophylaxis, mouth care, lung protective ventilation. Have a look at those. Most intensive care patients are on those these days, but what we do know is they actually um, will reduce the amount of time on a ventilator and will prevent injury, which so, so we should be following what they say. Um, there are some recognised complications of, of um, intensive care generally and of being on a ventilator, and some of them are quite serious. Um, so, you know, if, if we keep to our um, within our limits, if we keep within our scope of practice, if we, we check things, we um, keep assessing our patients and we keep those bundles going, we should be OK, actually, and we can prevent a lot of these um, complications from happening. So just the, the key messages, really, the key messages are that breathing is an essential daily activity and we do need to be able to perform it for some people who can't do it for themselves. Um, mechanical ventilation is one way of doing that and we can do it safely. We need to practice, train and be very careful. Um, delaying intubation and ventilation can be life threatening and people can die uh, if they don't get adequate um, and timely intubation and ventilation. So, um, you know, I mean, we're not saying do it quickly, but um, you know, keep an eye on patients and see who needs to be intubated, who needs to be ventilated. And if you can do, make those decisions in a timely, time, in a timely way. So the modes of ventilation really depend upon the patient, the disease, what the evidence says, lots of factors. But our advice would be to ask for further information and ask those people around you who are more um, experienced, perhaps, in using these modes of ventilation. But there's lots of books and guides out there as well. Um, so our advice is to use those. Always, always plan the care that you're going to do and monitor for changes and check everything as, as much as you can do on a regular basis to make sure that your patient is safe. Um, and the last thing to say really is, you know, care bundles can be a fantastic thing to use. Um, they are well, well supported by evidence. Um, you know, that's why we do them. So they're good practice to follow. So implement those wherever you can do. So in terms of further reading and resources, um, the Intensive Care Nursing, a Framework for Practice book is an excellent textbook um, and there is everything you would ever need to know about intensive care in there. But if you're looking for something a bit briefer, uh, there is the Oxford Handbook of Critical Care. There is also um, a Nursing Handbook of Critical Care and that one is uh, free at the moment for, for access. So um, go have a look at those resources if you can do. OK, well, I hope that's been useful. Uh, thanks for listening. Um, you know, hopefully, that hopefully there's been something in there that you can take and use um, in your practice. And um, key message, I guess, is keep talking to the people around you, keep asking questions, um, read and understand as much as you can do, um, and always, always stay safe. You know, PPE, um, I haven't really talked about in this, but PPE is a very important part of um, looking after intensive care patients and ventilator patients. So always make sure you have the right PPE and, uh, and stay safe. Thanks for listening.